chose two texts to share with you on this very special day. And the one is from Proverbs. It is the last chapter of Proverbs. And I just understood from Becky Wetzel that it is sung in Hebrew every Friday Sabbath by the men to the women. Isn't this interesting? Listen to God's word to you. A wife of noble character, who can find? She is worth far more than rubies. Her husband has full confidence in her and lacks nothing of value. She brings him good, not harm, all the days of her life. She selects wool and flax and works with eager hands. She is like the merchant ships, bringing her food from afar. She gets up while it is still night. She provides food for her family and portions for her women servants. She considers a field and buys it. Out of her earnings, she plants a vineyard. She sets about her work vigorously. Her arms are strong for her tasks. She sees her trading is profitable, and her lamp does not go out at night. In her hand, she holds the distaff and grasps the spindle with her fingers. She opens her arms to the poor and extends her hands to the needy. When it snows, she has no fear for her household, for all of them are clothed in scarlet. She makes coverings for her bed. She is clothed in fine linen and purple. Her husband is respected at the city gate, where he takes his seat among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them and supplies the merchants with sashes. She is clothed with strength and dignity. She can laugh at the days to come. She speaks with wisdom and faithful instruction is on her tongue. She watches over the affairs of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children arise and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. Many women do noble things, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting. But a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Honor her for all that her hands have done, and let her works bring her praise at the city gate. And then turning to second Luke, I want to share another different experience of a woman, a mother of a 12-year-old. Every year, Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up to the festival according to the custom. After the festival was over, while his parents were, were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were unaware of it. Thinking he was in their company, they traveled on for a day. And then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find Jesus, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days, they found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard Jesus was amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, Child, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Why were you searching for me? He asked. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he was saying to them. Then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And as Jesus grew up, he increased in wisdom and in favor with God and people. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Almighty God. 
We do give thanks for the privilege we have to worship, to open your word, and pray that you would open our hearts. Give us uh, a new truth, a way to understand better the scripture before us, that we might not only bring it into our own lives, but then share that truth with others. May the words of my mouth, meditations of our hearts, be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. <clears throat> As I was thinking back, I will have been ordained 30 years next month, and I think I've preached a Mother's Day sermon maybe two dozen times in those 30 years. And we were having a special calendar because of some renovation in the sanctuary. So we were having a stewardship season in the spring. And so one of those years, I chose not to preach on mothers on Mother's Day. And we did a, a stewardship message. Well, I may be a slow learner, but I have <laughs> never done that again. Yeah. And I am honoring our mothers today. Did you hear me? I want to honor our mothers. And, and when I um, do this on Mother's Day, I always remind people that it was Anna Jarvis from Grafton, West Virginia, in 1908, who was the first, we say in American history, to really try to push forward a national observance for Mother's Day, and that was because she loved her mother so very much and knew that other people did too. If you've ever wondered about the apostrophe on Mother's Day, these are the things that keep me up at night. I want you to know that Anna said the apostrophe was on a singular possession. It's to honor your mother every individual to honor their own mother. It was never meant by Anna Jarvis to have a plural possessive apostrophe commemorating all mothers in the world. Now Anna Jarvis had no way of knowing that what she started on that second Sunday of May would turn into an, ex an economic explosion called Mother's Day. The third biggest greeting card holiday in the United States, behind Christmas and Valentine's Day. 150 million greeting cards were sold this day at a cost of $671 million. That's why it's also called Hallmark Holiday. <laughs> It's the second biggest gift-giving holiday in the U.S. with $14.6 billion spent on Mother's Day gifts. Now, mine was a little short of that this morning for Dee Dee, but it's all from the heart. It's what you, the thought that counts, right? 60 million flowers are bought, costing $1.9 billion on this weekend. Obviously, most of us want to take advantage of this one day to express our deep love and our sincere appreciation for our mothers. And that's exactly what President Woodrow Wilson thought also on May 9, 1914. By an act of Congress, he established that this day would be Mother's Day, this second Sunday of May, as, quote, a public expression of our love and reverence for mothers of our country. And though the tradition which began with people wearing carnations or flowers, you remember that? I, I remember as a child seeing people of different colors, white carnations to honor departed mothers and red carnations or colored flowers to honor living mothers. Though that isn't followed as much now, the underlying message of Mother's Day is still the same, to share our deep love and our sincere appreciation to them. There are several scriptures that one could turn to, but I know that you've probably heard 
uh, a Mother's Day sermon on Proverbs 31. It is probably the most popular scripture to represent what was considered a traditional mother in that culture. Here we find an ancient description of the mother as steward or organizer of the household. Now it's interesting. This is the same word that we use for um, economy, oikonomos in Greek, which um, is the word for in Hebrew is what was given to Joseph who was a steward for the Pharaoh over the whole country of Egypt. So the same word is for the mother who is a steward over a household as Joseph was a steward over an entire country. This is the one who is up before all the others, cooking all the meals to a chef's perfection, shopping with prudence and a discerning eye, organizing and taking care of every last detail within the facet of every person's life of their family. I just got tired reading about everything that person did. It's amazing what mothers do. But nowadays, with working mothers also having to um, do both, is what our culture says, you kind of wonder how they keep on going. I grew up with a mother who was a stay-at-home mother. She did teach uh, piano lessons, but she Stayed home. You can kind of think of it as a kind of a leave it to beaver or a father knows best kind of image. She raised three children. It happened to be three boys. And we stretched her pretty thin at times and tested her limits of patience at times. Not me, but my other two brothers did <laughs> all the time. She taxied us everywhere to Little League games and piano lessons and scouts. And of course, she was the den mother. And she made sure that every night we did homework and took a bath, or so she thought. And then we were, she was the driving force behind us to go to Sunday school and to go to church. It wasn't a question if, it was we were at church because mom said so, because she was the organist and the choir director as well. All these other countless jobs that she did. It reminds me of that quote I heard of the mother who answered this somewhat berating businesswoman who asked the question, and what is your occupation with attitude? And so this homemaker mother says, well, I'm a research associate in the field of child development and human relations. And then sarcastically, the businesswoman says, well, just what do you do in your field? Well, I have a continuing program of research in a laboratory and in the field. I'm working for my master's. Actually, she could have said the whole family. And already have four credits. They were all daughters. Of course, the job is one of the most demanding of the humanities, and I often work 24-7. But the job is more challenging than the most run-of-the-mill any old career job, and the rewards are in satisfaction rather than money. And then she went home to those who were in her lab of 13, 7, and 6 years old, and an experimental version which was 6 months old upstairs. The women who have been the woman who's been identified as the ideal mother, however, is Mary, the mother of Jesus. She accepts without question or complaint hardships that befall her. She gives birth to a child in a stable. Later, a rebellious son whose activities brings about death. She doesn't make complaint. In spite of all these heartbreaks in her life, Mary never ceases to love or care for this wayward son and is there even at the cross when everyone else has left. The passage we naturally use to describe Mary as the ideal mother is from Luke 1. You remember that scene, the angel comes to Mary and says that she would bear a child and that child would be the Son of God. And though her role model is seen linguistically through the song of Hannah in the second chapter of Samuel, we gain some sense of who this woman is in these well-quoted words 
I am the Lord's servant. May it be to me as you have said. And even this poetic acceptance is embellished in what you and I know as the very popular song, Ava Maria. Now most of us would like to have the faith of this woman who could answer such an occasion demanding as she was in to say what she said. But Luke 2 is actually the passage that shows the realistic Mary. Mary is traveling home after a family vacation to Jerusalem, which they did every year to celebrate the Passover. It's a familiar road from Jerusalem up to Galilee and to Nazareth, their home. And she's probably doing all that multitasking that mothers do, thinking in her head of all those things that she has to do when she gets back, the cooking, the cleaning, the thank you notes of social events, the sewing, the negotiating relationships, the caring for children, and then she stops. Where's Jesus? Now, now most of us have, have had something like that happen. Dee Dee and I were in Banner Oak, North Carolina at the Arbordale Presbyterian Church and we sometimes would take two cars. You know that we have three children and each of us took one child home from church. <laughs> but I thought you had. No, I thought you had. So we get in the car and go back up to the church. But that child wasn't at the church. Then we got even more frantic when back home. The church luckily was in walking distance. And he walked home that day. You left me at the church. <laughs> He's never recovered from that incident. <laughs> but the time that I was at the lumber store talking to this guy about paint, and I had the same child with me, and after about two or three minutes, I looked around, no child. And the guy's trying to sell me the paint. And I kind of look down this aisle. You know how you try to be polite? And then you look down this aisle. And then you stop being polite. And you go way over here and look down all the aisles. And way over there. And finally you just say, lock the doors. I can't find my child. I had the whole, the whole place looking for Graham. He was in the back corner sitting in one of the tubs. As a two-year-old, well, isn't that what you do? You go sit in the tub. We couldn't, no one could see him in the aisle for 10 minutes. He didn't recover from that one either. You know, I don't know. You know, I know what Mary was feeling. Frantic, panic, heart pounding. She and Joseph assumed that Jesus was in the group. They go look with the relatives. They go look with the friends. No Jesus. They go back after one day. Do you remember what it said? Three more days. One day of travel. Four days he's been alone. Left home alone. He's left behind for four days. And as a mother, Mary's reaction to Jesus is realistic. We can relate to it. Child, why have you treated us like this? Look, your father and I have been searching for you in great anxiety. Not quite the words that I would say. But this is probably the real Mary. No need to impress angels right here. You're just right in front of your child in the vernacular say, you're saying, son, what the heck you think you're doing? You weren't with our group. We're going home. Now what's really interesting here though is, and it's even more interesting, if you're trying to understand Mary as a mother, then her significant influence of Jesus is seen in his answer. Why were you searching for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? For 12 years, Mary had taught and influenced Jesus, molded him to help him understand who he was, and whose he was, taught him to read, memorize in scripture, to express himself clearly, to communicate with others on different levels, to be independent, to rely on his faith. This story of Jesus left behind at the temple, it tells us at least two things about Mary. One, that she's not perfect. She's just like you and me. And two, it helps us understand how influential 
mothers are to all of us. In, in all my life, I've always seen the mother carry the responsibility in the household for faith development in most of the families that we encounter. It's a, it's a fascinating responsibility that all of us have, not just mothers, but the Spanish proverb makes it even clearer. An ounce of mother is worth a pound of clergy. Now let me take a tangent here and say a word for those who were not influenced so lovingly by their mothers. It could be that God has placed another woman to fill that role in your life. This is what happened to Paul. You can find it at the very end of his theological treatise to the Romans. Very end of chapter 16, verse 13 or 14 right in there. He says something that's fascinating. Give my greetings to Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother and mine. Now this statement can be taken two ways, his mother and mine. It could mean that two different women, Rufus's mother and Paul's mother. But most commentaries don't believe that. What most people think is Paul is saying that this mother of Rufus is like a mother to me. If that is what it meant, then it raises some interesting questions, doesn't it? When and where did Paul meet Rufus's mother? Did she nurse him through some serious illness? Did she receive him into her home for some extended stay during one of his missionary journeys? How did this woman and Paul form such a close bond that he refers to her fondly as being like his own mother? Well, you've got to go somewhere else to possibly answer that. In the Gospel of Mark, tells us that Simon of Cyrene, remember Simon? He's the one who carried the cross of Jesus. Do you remember that he says that he had two sons? One was Alexander and one was Rufus. Now, was this the same Rufus to whom Paul was speaking? If that is true, then his mother will be Simon of Cyrene's wife. Now, no one knows for sure who this remarkable woman was who served as a mother figure for the great Paul. But it tells us that sometimes God places other women in our lives to play such an important an influential role for us. Take it a step further. Maybe you are that important person in someone else's life. Finally, it's always difficult for me to preach on Mother's Day or on Father's Day because not everyone has had the experience that I have had. Every experience is different, and some of them are not positive. Also, because I want to be sensitive that not all women are mothers. So let me just share a word with those women who do not have children for various reasons. Perhaps the most famous mother of all time is Mother Teresa. Do you remember she won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1979? This woman, who was never a biological mother, is known for showing the greatest and deepest and purest actions which epitomize the love of a mother for a child, or perhaps even the love of God for each of us. 
Her life motto, and this is what, if you take anything away from this sermon, please remember these words. Her life motto was, let the Jesus in me serve the Jesus in you. I love that t-shirt that was seen at the Chautauqua Institute, which there are several families in our congregation that attend that great institution. This t-shirt said, please God, don't let me be behind Mother Teresa at Judgment Day. (laughs) But what about letting that be your motto, my motto? Let the Jesus in me serve the Jesus in you. Isn't this what motherhood is all about? Letting the love of Jesus flow in and through us to others, our children, other children, other people. This is why God has blessed us, blessed us so much with those who are a blessing and those who have influenced us for the rest of our lives. This is who we are supposed to be to others, to let the Jesus in me serve the Jesus in you. And so my prayer is that all of us will make that our motto, the motto of Mother Teresa. So may God bless all of you as we do just that. And happy Mother's Day.